Um, this is a time to open your mind a little bit, and uh, we're going to discuss some future models for unscheduled care. So as you heard us talking earlier uh, about uh, how freestandings fit in, how urgent cares fit in, uh, there's, there's an opportunity for us to use uh, further expansion and be able to look at uh, how our pre-hospital care providers and you, how you all as pre-hospital care providers uh, may be fitting into a future world. Uh, before we get there, I want to take a moment and say thank you to our organizer and the person whose unlimited energy and dedication to this has made this a great session for all of us, Sherry Welch. Uh, year after year, <laughs> year after year, uh, threat, uh, does incredible things and frets over every detail of making sure this is going to be an effective forum for you all to learn and for us to be able to talk about innovation and what's moving our world ahead. And Sherry, your singular dedication to this is incredible and we're, we're all beneficiaries of it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Keep up the good work and, uh, and please um, know how much your dedication supports the, the work that we go on uh, across the country every day. So. Okay, so not just the rig, the paramedicine movement, mobile integrated healthcare, where are we moving? In front of you in your book is a complete slide deck. In 30 minutes, I have no time uh, to go through all those slides, but at some point you need to understand this field and how to explain it to others uh, who are around you in the field, and, and so you have a complete slide deck. Uh, many of you in this room uh, know Johnny and Roy, and uh, your interest in emergency care sprung back to um, Rescue 51, operating out of an LA County station with this idea about being able to call physicians and get orders to start uh, IVs with D5 and W and, uh, and, and so on. And the salty nurse at the other end of the line who was very dedicated to this program and made it work, Nurse Dixie. And, uh, and so from very humble beginnings, uh, of course, the early days of uh, moving people um, stemmed from the nursing home, or I'm sorry, the, uh, it's even worse than that, the funeral home industry, not the nursing home industry, the funeral home industry who used their hearses, uh, with the hearses literally rushing to the scene to get the dead body. The first one there got the dead body, the second one would pick up whatever patients were available for transport. Uh, we started with a system dedicated to uh, service in communities, but funded by the federal government. And so the early models from the 70s uh, took this out of the, of the funeral home industry and put it into whatever industry would pick it up locally. In some places that was hospitals, some places that was a third service, some places a fire department, some places it was law enforcement. Uh, some places had the benefit of people coming from Vietnam. <laughs> And many of our early wonderful field caregivers and physician assistants came out of the battlefields and knew what good pre-hospital care meant to survival of their friends, their soldiers, uh, and the medics in the field, and those that worked on the choppers that were working in Vietnam brought back valuable experience to this. Uh, and they began to think through this, uh, this system of accountable regional emergency systems and who should be leading it. Uh, and then the 911 system, and in many communities you linked fire EMS uh, because that was the cost beneficial place for many communities. Uh, and, and the, uh, the, the uh, siting of this at fire stations, which are within six minutes of most of our urbanized areas of the country, uh, was a natural. So we, we have always, uh, in this industry, in emergency care, tried to listen to the customer and you all have jobs because customers have spoken uh, and the customers have said, we love what you all do and we love that you're accessible and we love that we feel you're high quality. Uh, and by the way, all of you know in your community that the hat that you wear and the hat is you guys in the emergency system, you, you know everything that goes on in your community. Now you may not be in the trauma center in your community, you may not be in the pediatric center in your community, but your neighbors think that you know everything that goes on in the field. There was a wreck last night that they saw and they knew somebody was hurt. What was going on with that patient? You go, well, I'm, I, you know, I don't work in the trauma. They don't accept that. You are supposed to know what happened to that patient. Last. There was a baby that was sick. Uh, what, what happened to that baby? Well, I, I don't know. I don't work at the children's. Not acceptable. You have to come up with an answer. 
The government has handed us the responsibility. We talked about EMTALA. Uh, the, the corresponding responsibility is if you advertise yourself as a 911 uh, service provider, that when somebody calls on the phone, you will show up at their door. And our systems of using phone triage to refuse people care going out, 100% of the time uh, results in a, a uh, down code or a non-response to the wrong call and there's a cardiac arrest that was occurring that somebody described as something else, that's a no-show either. And so we, we call, you call, we arrive, is, is the mantra of the 911 system. People want the right care, right place, right time, and, uh, and for the right amount of money, and that's one of our challenge issues right now. Uh, but what they really want is right care, right place, right time, and that's been an element of both the emergency care system and the pre-hospital care system. So we have this opportunity to not only sit on the phones or sit in our emergency departments and take care of people, uh, but actually to move this out and make it mobile. My first challenge in the field, I, I started in pre-hospital care when I was in medical school. Uh, I became a firefighter. My wife became an EMT and then a paramedic. We worked together on an ambulance uh, in a fire-based uh, EMS system. Uh, and my first challenge was actually in the emergency department one day. Uh, we had a very large patient who had been moved into RED, uh, since I talked about it before, Miami Valley Hospital in Dayton, Ohio. A 650, 700 pound person had been moved out of their apartment and uh, hurt two of the fire EMS people who tried to bring her down the steps of her apartment. Um, she was treated in RED and through extraordinary means was, was able to be released and went back home. She had a complication of her treatment at home and called 911 again. And, uh, and Dayton Fire called the emergency department and said, would you please, instead of us hurting two more people or more, bringing her out of her apartment again, is there any way that you could send care to her in the field? And so we bundled up an emergency medicine resident, got great information over the phone so we knew what we needed to do to unclog her catheter in the field. We sent somebody capable of doing it out to the field, taking care of her problem. We didn't have to remove her, no bill was created, and we all went back in service. Got it? Is that fair care? Is that rational care? Is that responsible, cost-effective care, not hurting more people, moving her? Uh, in the long term, well, the post is we assigned a case manager, eventually got her moved into a place on a ground floor, and then set her up for the bariatric process, et cetera. So there was ongoing case management of that care. Uh, and, and did the city make a rational decision with their, with their fire EMS department calling us and asking for care going to the field? Who did we get a complaint from? Who did we get a complaint from? The neighbors who said, very bluntly, why, why does the fat girl get treatment in her house and, and I'm skinny and I can't get the same care? Stunning. Stunning. You, you think you've done a great thing and the complaints roll in. And, uh, but, it, but it sets you to thinking, why, why don't we have this system to provide the right care, right place, right time, avoiding cost, in this case avoiding injuring a couple more people, uh, and, and we could deliver care at the, in, these, in these very early days of doing it over the radio because there weren't even cell phones at, at the time. So that's about integrated service and care. This was the slide, and, um, and this is my most important slide that I teach from right here. And Nick uh, pointed out this slide earlier. So this is the evolution of our healthcare system in the United States of America and on most of the globe. Uh, for many years, we had hospital-based health care. It was for acute care. It was for, in rural communities, all medical care cited at the hospital. Uh, it was for tuberculosis patients, leprosy patients, um, patients with mental health went to the state mental hospitals, uh, et cetera. We had a hospital-based health care system. The federal government, with the advent of uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and when they said that they would not pay for uh, physician house calls was when emergency medicine and emergency medical services was born and when there had to be a pre-hospital care system set up and a further growth of the community-based healthcare system. So you all watched this happen. Most of you were at least alive in the 70s uh, as we then moved into a system where people had to be moved around and we began to grow the, the upper strata, which is community-based healthcare. 
which at that time were doctor's offices, uh, but then urgent cares came up in the 80s, and then we began to build the, the McSurgery centers uh, and dialysis centers and other things, outpatient facilities, and the federal government shifted their funding uh, so that they wanted to uh, advocate for community-based health care. In between was a little squiggly line at the time uh, that we'll call unscheduled care, and that was the EDs and the emergency medical service system, uh, and then we keep adding elements, urgent care, freestanding emergency departments, WebMD, eye triage, uh, et cetera, so that people can get more and more care, and our strata keeps growing. And, and if you think through this, our job is efficient movement of people between community and hospital-based care. Uh, and many of those people we successfully keep in an outpatient care system. And you guys know what it's like to be in the ED when people have failed outpatient care. And your job is to do the diagnostics and treatment to get them plugged in. They go into the acute care uh, hospital-based system for a while. They get tuned up, and then they go back to community-based care. And, and then you're responsible for them again if anything doesn't go well. Right? Everybody understand this? So this is a really important strata document that shows what our function is in the modern healthcare system. Other countries, I, I told you, two-tiered systems typically, the government-based national health service, a gray market for care, and an unscheduled care system that often in European countries features a doctor who runs around in some form of a rig. Uh, in, in France, very famous because they blew the care of what patient? Princess Di. And uh, we're trying to save somebody who had a, a lacerated pulmonary artery. That's not a pre-hospital care treatment uh, setup. Uh, and, and the surgeons in, in the either country blew up at each other about uh, who killed Princess Diana. Okay? So this, this is important that you use this slide to think through what is the potential for your future. For those of you young enough, I have no doubt part of your career is going to be spent in the field. No doubt. You may want to stay in the ED. A few of you may be lucky enough to spend your entire career there, uh, but most of you are going to spend some of your time in the field. For the nursing personnel in here, uh, you have uh, made a good life working in the emergency department. Many of you around the hospital at some point. Many of you are going to make this turn also and be doing outpatient care as we move to a system that more and more encourages care for people in their homes and then ties them in with the system that's uh, both 911, uh, but also the I've fallen and can't get up system, and then everything that relates around visiting nurses, okay? So uh, clearly, the 911 uh, system is the service that allows sick patients to go home uh, or to stay home. And in most cases, that's what people want to do. In the hospital, very frankly, it's not a very pleasant environment. It's dry. The food's not good. You don't get your own schedule, and they keep you up all night. It's not a very good place to be for a long time. So to, to think through this and to design this, regional accountable emergency systems have to have certain elements. And those elements revolve around where's the right place to do unscheduled care, and then how, again, to you move people efficiently between the different strata. Uh, the regional accountable emergency systems, these are supposed to have little blocks around them that have somehow disappeared. But if you think about our system, uh, the, the nut, the core nut of, of our work is we take care of really sick or really badly injured people, right? That, that's our job. If you work at Maryland Trauma, you're in that little box in the lower right-hand corner there. And if somebody comes in with a sprained ankle, they still get an IV above and below the diaphragm, pan scanned, uh, they get a tube in every orifice, and they get a finger in every orifice. Is that, is that what happens at Maryland Trauma? They're about critical care. And many of you wanted to do this field based on your ability to do critical care. Uh, the reality is we can't pay the bills on critical care. We can't pay the bills. We can't keep you in service. We can't give you a job just doing that unless you're one of the few people that works in Maryland Trauma. Uh, instead, we are the diagnostic and treatment service, and you heard that earlier about the CT scan won't be paid for unless it's an emergency and done in the emergency department. So the primary care guy sends his patient through uh, because they can get a scan or they can get an ultrasound of the gallbladder or whatever it is because that gets done in the ED. And then every primary physician knows if they want their patient plugged in, 
They get them plugged in much more quickly, and they get a built-in uh, secondary look at their patient, second opinion, from the emergency physician and the nurses who are taking care of that patient. So we are the diagnostic and treatment service for the community. And I will, I will say again, in many rural communities, that's the only source of that service. Then, uh, we have become the triage service for everyone, for everything. And then finally, the Y'all Come Center uh, for whatever ails you at whatever time of the day or night. You lost your script, the dog ate your pills, uh, whatever it is. Uh, if you're in town or out of town, the place to go to get that service, 24, 365, only one place in the community with the lights on, that's the emergency department. So I understand our evolution through this as we develop this system. All right, the, um, the big numbers uh, would say, uh, we saved a lot of people from dying prematurely. That was the early part of my career. And we moved those people to be older and to have medical problems, fair enough. Is that a success story? Is that a success story? Is that a story of failure? It's a great success story. We didn't recognize it. We haven't shaken our hands. We haven't thought through with the implications of when we don't have people die early in cardiac arrest, burn up in a house fire, wrapped around a tree at age 16, they get old and they get sick. When they get old and they get sick, the primary care guy says, too sick to see in my office, go to the emergency department. And by the way, the expense of the health system, does it go up or down? It goes up, only one way to do that. And you heard uh, 10 years ago, somebody said we should let people continue to smoke because that reduces the overall health care bill of the country, they die early, fair enough. All right, so, uh, and then I told you the other day about the trauma population aging. Um, so, um, this is, uh, boy oh boy, um, this is the, the grammatical, the, the graph of cardiac arrests in the county where I grew up, in Montgomery County, uh, Ohio, which is Dayton, 600,000 population, and we did very careful tracking of cardiac arrests through the years. The first, the first line on the left-hand side is the 1970s and early 80s when I first started running on a medic unit. Uh, and we ran in the, in the county about five cardiac arrests a day. Five cardiac arrests a day. A typical scenario for a patient back then is a 50-year-old man down on the sidewalk in what rhythm? What rhythm? V-fib, 50-year-old man in V-fib. We came in with our early versions. Those of you remember the sexiness of the Life Pack 5, the first one handed defibrillator. Grease up the paddles, put them on the patient, get them shocked, get a rhythm back. High percentage, high percentage of 50 year old men back. Put them in the rig, give them a dose of lidocaine and a lidocaine drip take them to our state-of-the-art heart hospital where they got state-of-the-art heart care, which was two weeks of bed rest on heparin, right? So that's the 70s, early 80s. In the early 80s, we began cracking chests in 49-year-old men, if you'll think through the model with me, 49-year-old men whose spouses said, you know, your dad died, your uncle died, et cetera, and, and you're beginning to show signs that, that things aren't working so well, so I want you to go see your primary care guy who sends you the cardiologist, you fail your treadmill, you go see the surgeon who says opportunity to crack, opportunity to cut is an opportunity to cure, crack his chest, replumb him, and then he becomes a 55-year-old man that we would see in the ED, uh, bleeding from his aspirin, or having complications from his chest wall being opened, or his, uh, he had chest pain and didn't know what that meant, and so, instead of being dead at age 50 in V-fib cardiac arrest, uh, he's alive. But we noticed our cardiac arrest count going down. And the bottom line, the right-hand side here is, is the 2010s. And in 2010 in Dayton, Ohio, same numbers in Atlanta, Georgia, same numbers in Washington, D.C., we see one cardiac arrest a day. One cardiac arrest, five a day to one a day. In the one-a-day presentation, anybody want to describe the scenario for cardiac arrest today in your community? What, what's it look like? Age? 80 plus. Medical conditions? This many. Medications? This many. Okay. Presenting rhythm? Asystole. My son asked me, you guys talked about the people you used to resuscitate. I very rarely resuscitate anymore. Am I a bad paramedic? Did I have bad equipment? What's the problem? 
the patients, you, you're not Jesus. You can't put your hands on them and resurrect them out of asystole death. Okay, two places where we can resuscitate people at a much higher rate other than Seattle, which I still don't think has the correct numbers. Where do we resuscitate people in the community from cardiac arrest? Airport and casinos. Uh, and, and what is different about airports and casinos? An entirely different patient population and AEDs. So our AEDs, when did we really need AEDs? What decade? 70s, okay? And uh, right now we don't need them so much and our cardiac arrest population results are dismal and they should be because what have we been doing instead? Spending money preventing cardiac arrests, okay? Now, I, we still get saves, you guys get saves, they're incredible saves, young people every once in a while with weird diseases, love, love doing that. Uh, but just remember, here's another success story that we didn't tell and AEDs came too late. So if you wanna think about Dayton, Ohio, Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, DC, we've added 1,000 people a year back to the population that in earlier years would have been dead. And they have chest disease, cardiovascular disease, they get older, and we have cancer rates going up. Why are cancer rates going up? Because people are alive to get cancer. In the old days, they would have died early. So our cancer rates have to go up. And you guys have to know, a lot of your patients present with acute coronary syndromes. And a lot of their presentations are atypical, right? Very unusual chest pain is the presenting symptom uh, for acute MIs anymore. And, and we keep building these patients. And we're shocked that telebeds are short, all right? So the, the model, again, is a changing patient mix. And this is uh, graphically what I showed you uh, two days ago, uh, which is our population in the emergency department is more medical, fewer injuries, more mental health and chemical dependency. So this is a graph over the decades of what's happened in the emergency department. Oh, by the way, and EMS. EMS predicts your admission rates. And uh, for all of you who work in places where you're still interested in more admissions coming through the ED, if you invite more ambulances to your door, you will get more admitted patients. End of discussion. No matter what cohort you're in, uh, ambulance arrival rate is a very good predictor of admission rate. So, over 40 years, how has our emergency medical service system been growing? Well, they've, they've been, become very good at delivering field care. Uh, they have become very skilled at getting people out of complicated situations. Uh, they have really participated in prevention programs. And as an industry, no, more, no better prevention programs than in the aeromedical industry. We don't have, you guys aren't worried about your plane flight home today. Uh, because in aeromedical, we have, we have aero in the uh, aeronautical systems and in, in air travel, we have prevented major commercial plane accidents to a high degree. And the fire industry has prevented fires at a very high degree. We have a lot to learn from those two industries. Uh, I want to take you on another journey with me to Washington, D.C., uh, where the uh, uh, fire prevention industry results in a lot smaller number of, of structure fires in Washington, D.C., your nation's capital, all right? Um, the uh, EMS uh, portion of calls has greatly increased, and the mayor said we want to do um, patient um, Presgany scoring. It's not Presgany, uh, but they want to do Presgany scores. The EMS system uh, in Washington, D.C., reflects what happens in many, many communities. When you query people about their happiness with EMS coming to their door and picking them up or picking up their grandma, they're very, very happy with that system. The uh, uh, dissatisfied patients we follow up with, and a lot of times it was technical issues. Um, they weren't happy uh, that the medic unit wouldn't take them to Fairfax Hospital. Uh, or that they wanted to be moved to the dialysis center, uh, or it hurt when an IV was put in in the patient. So even following this up, this is a pretty high satisfaction level. And where are we designing the system to move? Uh, well, part of the design uh, has to relate to numbers, and I showed you yesterday the very big numbers associated with this. I want to point out that right now in this country there are about 28 million ambulance runs that relate to the emergency system. So this doesn't count dialysis runs for ambulances. This is 28 million ambulances arriving in emergency departments uh, with a total bill to you 
and to the rest of the country about $6 billion in that system. Uh, they began to collect information and recognize their role in the field, moving people around. Um, they, uh, in many communities, in, in many of the services that I deal with, uh, our number one call provider uh, in the 911 system is nursing homes. Lots and lots of nursing home calls. And uh, our systems are very much organized to provide care to people in their homes and in the public buildings uh, and on the streets. And our system is not set up to do routine nursing home runs. And in some cases, uh, they want us to come with a 911 rig and replace a Foley catheter or replace a G-tube or, or something like that. Um, and, and triage of patients from nursing homes leaves a lot to be desired. Medicare Medicaid, I want you to be aware, has heard the calls from the EMS industry to stop this. And what do you all think about those patients arriving in the emergency department? They don't belong there. We could do much better in designing systems. Um, most importantly, the patients who come from the nursing home are typically very unhappy. We can't water them, feed them, turn them uh, the way that they can in their bed at the nursing home, and they would much prefer to go back there or have stayed there rather than be worked up in the ED or worked up in the ED and admitted to the hospital. Uh, and so we have a patient-driven process again that says let's design a system that doesn't use 911 rigs to be moving nursing home patients between the hospital and then a non-emergent rig taking them back to the nursing home. Uh, so are there models uh, for, for care that are better than this? Well, certainly there are. Uh, and these include things like mobile diagnostics, mobile treatment, uh, care that is coordinated through care management systems. Uh, and, and with those really comes very significant cost savings. Uh, building in this is a system that really has done cu good customer service for many years. 911 providers are typically very popular in their community. And by the way, the drivers of a lot of public opinion related to your hospital if you're in a competitive world. Uh, and, and it always has to be a reminder, um, they're out in the community transporting a certain number of patients, okay? But their greater influence, they typically live somewhere in the community. And if you're in a two-hospital town, uh, most of those people have a preferred hospital. And when all their neighbors or the mayor or anybody asks, uh, where should I go to get care? I'm new to this community. The most influential person on the street is typically the paramedic or firefighter who runs with the EMS service. And they say, you know, we prefer... St. Joe's to General Hospital any day. We only take our bad patients to General Hospital, uh, and they're always mean to us. And so we take all the nice people and the paying patients to St. Joe's. Duh. That's, that's really a, a big influencer of a lot of people's decisions. And so not only do these people make really uh, important decisions for the patients they deal with, but they influence a lot of people who are going for much more generalized care and will build a relationship with one hospital or the other in the community based on the advice of the person who lives down the street from them. All right, um, again, public education, important roles, who does seatbelt training, MAD training, SAD training, how to wear your bike helmet training, uh, how to put the child's seat safely in the car training. Uh, Fire EMS has, has done this for a very long period of time, and they're very successful. Every October is Fire Prevention Month. They do a whole month. Every child knows stop, drop, and roll, all, the, all of the things that you know. This is a very good industry in teaching prevention. Uh, where I live now, the kid in the pool is, is our nightmare scenario, and a lot more premature deaths occur with kids around pools and in bodies of water than we would like, so it's become a major prevention. And then for all of our uh, elderly living at home by themselves, uh, our ability to introduce the I've fallen and can't get up system is a lifesaver for many of those elder people. So now gearing programs towards our extremes of age and our dependent populations, if you will, young people and what happens to them and what causes them to die prematurely, and our active elderly still attempting to stay at home and, uh, and want to maintain their independence and don't want to spend your health care dollars, we got to find ways to serve them better. Uh, one of the pieces of this, if you're not familiar with your EMS system, is what are called lift assist calls now. And lift assist in the departments that I run with are now 5 to 10% of our call volume. And the call comes in, 
uh, you know, we're trying to keep mom at home, and it's just us girls, and we try to transfer, but sometimes she slides out, or we're trying to put her on the potty, and she got caught off the potty, and we need somebody to come and help. They don't want transport service. Uh, instead, they want somebody to come with enough beef that can move, uh, move that person to the right place that they belong being. Uh, occasionally, these are transfers out of the car because they just came home from the hospital and they're in somebody's car and they can't get them up to the second floor apartment. Uh, so lift assist calls have become a significant burden on 911 systems, how to manage them, how to do them safely. When does a lift assist turn into a transport call? Uh, sometimes they're calling you for assistance in doing that because the family called with the expectation you were going to lift assist and you come with your EMS expertise and say, no, they need to be transported to the hospital. And they're not very happy. And, uh, and so they call the emergency department and ask for advice from the nurses and physicians there to do that. Um, so here is one community's Make the Right Call public education program to tell people when they should call the 911 system and when they should expect an ambulance. Uh, what was the purpose of this? To increase or reduce 911 calls. What was the purpose? To reduce them. What was the effect? Increases them. Uniformly, 100% of the time, every time we tell people don't call 911 or don't go to the emergency department, what is the result in behavior? Volume increases, all right? And we still haven't learned how to do this correctly, and so far nobody has the answer to how it will work. Demand management in, in convenient pocket size is a program called iTriage, and uh, iTriage some of you use because it's also a registration program. Uh, for your emergency department. So I triage, designed by an emergency physician in Denver, uh, gives you a set of symptoms that you put in there, and it says based on the symptoms that you put in, if you're not any way related to the healthcare system, it says you ought, to, you ought to call your doctor, you ought to go to a local urgent care center, and by the way, it has maps to the local urgent care centers. Or you should go to an emergency department, it's got maps to those, and in places where hospitals have paid for eye triage, then the hospital that pops up at the top is the one that paid for uh, the eye triage advertisements, if you will. Uh, so that's eye triage, and uh, that's a schedule an appointment and register yourself uh, version of the app. Uh, so if you're in a community that has these, this is triage in the field in convenient pocket size form on your phone. Domain management for hospitals, uh, this is about diversion and, and our want to uh, divert ambulances at critical times. I, I told you the economics of that and I gave you a much better example in my handout materials the other day. This is terrible behavior. We should never do it unless the emergency department is literally on fire. Nonetheless, in many communities, this is a sport, okay? And they wait for one hospital and then there's what's called defensive diversion and because you don't want any of that hospital's patients. EMS is literally standing in the field wondering what to do, and then you're forcing them to make decisions, or you're forcing them to, do, to tell the family the wrong thing, which is, you know, your mom wants to go back to a general hospital, and they're on diversion, and, uh, and the family says, well, I, mom's got to go to general. That's where her doctor is and where her, all the records are. And the medic crew says, well, we can't take her there. They will forbid us from bringing her there. And, uh, and then the family says, well, is there an alternative? And then our crew members say, well, if we help you into the car, if she goes by car, uh, then they can't refuse. Is that any kind of good behavior on anybody's side? No. So when I was in D.C. in 2009, in the middle of the H1N1 outbreak, we ended diversion, no diversion. And you probably know in certain states like Massachusetts, diversion is outlawed, as is putting them on the wall, wall time for the EMS, have them carry lawn chairs and carry money in their pockets so they could go get money from the vending machines to pay for something for the patient that you won't accept their care. This is all completely bad behavior, uh, is very expensive behavior. Um, and, and will cost you a lawsuit at some point in the future. So, uh, where are successful stories about how to manage this and how are communities and the 911 systems and public safety providers uh, looking to, to uh, end this behavior? Uh, in the city state uh, that is Washington, D.C., uh, they recognize that some people were frequent flyers in the system uh, or what we call familiar faces. Fair enough? 
The familiar face program was called Street Calls and was based on a program in San Francisco. And every month, the 25 highest users of the 911 EMS system uh, were put into a queue. And we took two very streetwise paramedics, two very streetwise EMTs, a social worker, and a physician assistant. We leased two vehicles and we said, go to work reducing demand. Their job was not to create new services in the District of Columbia. It was to figure a way to better use the services that were already available at hospitals, with district agencies, with mental health and chemical dependency places, with nursing homes, and with existing case managers in the hospitals. Uh, and one by one, they picked off 25 patients a month for the first couple months. Uh, and and we're, we're called close the gap people, close the gap. What does this patient really need that they're not getting and resulting in them calling 911 and, go, and being transported to a hospital? So the Close the Gap program uh, served uh, the, the frequent flyers, and then we added on, as they got really good at doing this, we added on more patients uh, to them so that case managers from the hospitals could call any time and say, you know, Joe Smith has been a, he doesn't come through 911, uh, but he comes to us every third day, uh, dropped off by a taxi. Uh, will you please find out what he needs and what we can do better to serve him? Uh, the the uh, many, many other ways that we could refer patients in, and street calls developed a life. And what it did was, in a very dramatic way, decrease utilization by our familiar faces. All right? Uh, and here, what, is, what are the elements of success of a program like this? Uh, the elements of success are um, focused activity around our frequent flyers. <laughs> uh, number two, these are people who are used to being on the streets and they go in with something on their back that says Fire EMS. Uh, they would go anywhere on the streets. They're familiar with all the projects and comfortable moving in and out of the projects. And one of the stories that frequently comes is this person uses it because visiting nurse won't come in their neighborhood. It's too dangerous. Every time the old visiting nurse program came, uh, their car would get broken into or they felt threatened, they carried their little medical bag in and somebody thought it had narcotics in it and they stole the bag from the, from the visiting nurse. So with that background, re putting these people who are streetwise and very frankly came in with fire EMS on their clothing, no threat, and they moved the people effectively through the system and found effective ways to be able to care for them along with the hospital-based case managers who were critical, and then we did placements and other things that brought much success to this program. How much time? My timer is? Nine minutes, okay. We have uh, another problem in the community, which is this ACS issue, uh, which, is, which is calling for an answer from us. Most hospitals, uh, the number one admission to the hospital is rule out cardiovascular disease, rule out ACS, rule out MI, et cetera. And what is the solution to this? Well, ACS is the disease formerly known as chest pain, uh, and it's now all these weird presentations, pull out the 12-lead EKG, do some cardiac enzymes, uh, do a focused workup uh, that Rick Bucata gives to us, uh, but still some of these people you're worried about, so you stick them on the tele unit, right? Well, what if we uh, took them and put them on in a, in a shirt designed at Georgia Tech that's got uh, embedded 80 leads, <laughs> and, and we put it attached to an OnStar call box uh, on their, on their uh, belt, and instead of sending them up to the tele unit, we send them home. And the smart box, just like the smart box in your OnStar car, says when something triggers it, like your airbag going off, uh, then, then it calls you, and, uh, and the, the trigger for this could be a, a lethal rhythm or ST segments that are elevating and lighting up the 80 lead EKG, uh, and then they call you and say, just like they do in your car, uh, Jim Augustine, uh, your silver suburban <laughs> airbag deployment, and by the way, it gives a complete report on your crash based on the black box in your car, to, this, the, to the call center in Warren, Michigan, uh, with a 10-digit 911, the closest PSAP to that location where my Suburban is in a wreck. And it says, are you injured? Do you need EMS? Uh, and, and I answer the OnStar in my car and say, yes, uh, it appears somebody's injured here and, and there's fluids down, so send fire to. And that's, that's a passive system, right? Well, what if that was on the belt 
and attach to the patient, uh, same as the I've fallen and can't get up system. That's a version of the I've fallen and can't get up that works real well in the world, world of ACS. So solutions for not only ACS but many other medical issues, uh, future use of telematics and all the things that can be attached to a smartphone. So you've seen all of the versions of this now from little stethoscope devices, heart and lung listening devices, um, otoscopes that can go in the ear, uh, blood pressure uh, devices that can be attached to your iPhones. Uh, all of these are coming versions uh, of the digital tools that can be used, will be used in the field. What we need to make this work is, a, is an easy medical record. And you and I know this would be beneficial in the emergency department too. Please make it work in the field and in the ED so that unscheduled care is facilitated rather than frustrated uh, by the medical record. So uh, in Dayton, uh, we developed a program called CareNow. And the CareNow program, elements of which you have heard about here, uh, already in previous presentations says, you know, not everybody with an unscheduled care need needs to go to the ED. Uh, and if we put a program together with a call center and we had a committed group of providers who would go into the field, we can eliminate many transports, we can reduce cost, uh, we can save our insurance companies and the Medicaid system a lot of money. And Care Now of Dayton was created with long-term benefits, payer participation, the right pricing for the services delivered, uh, and that program, uh, uh, all of the roots of it are now what's called mobile integrated healthcare. And one of the problems that we have with mobile integrated healthcare, so far it is not being paid for uh, unless a hospital or foundation pays for it. So far the federal government has not moved the needle in terms of paying for pre-hospital care services delivered by anybody other than visiting nurses or other professional organizations. What the industry has been doing is experimenting with various ones of these. Could everybody raise their hand who has some form of a mobile integrated healthcare program uh, being researched in their community? We you raise your hands? So probably a third of you in here have some version of this. If, if I was to ask you for details, each of you would have different details and it's designed by and funded by a different group in each of the communities that have their hands raised here. Uh, nonetheless, these are all little research labs that are going on and are gonna find ways and they're gonna report on ways. And the EMS Compass is one of the ways where they're putting together the stories and then putting together performance measures. Uh, and the reason that we're asked to do that is the ED performance measures were created by the Benchmarking Alliance. And so they've asked for us to participate in putting together what are performance measures for integrated mobile healthcare uh, that could be modeled after what we do in the emergency department, but more importantly, modeled over what goes on in the field uh, to be able to deliver the care. So they're going to figure out systems um, that assist us and that we will be participative of. Uh, and some of you are gonna have a career doing care outside of the friendly confines of the emergency department. Uh, our future really is not just about cost and benefit, uh, but about what's right to do in our communities. And oh, by the way, is common sense and saves a lot of money. I think that all of you should get active in learning about these different models. Uh, most importantly, the ones that are occurring in your community, but secondarily, the ones that are being uh, done nationally and will at some point soon influence uh, the patients we receive in the ED. I think the most important group that they're going to begin to, to influence the care of is the nursing home patient with really needs that could be cared for in the nursing home uh, at a far lower cost and far better comfort of the patient if done there rather than that movement of the patient into the emergency department. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you for the opportunity to present something that's a little out of the box but something you need to be aware of and again, something you should be thankful for we have less premature death. You are a contributor to that, and we all should thank each other for what we have done in that area. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.